Welcome to this evening's seminar with Dr. Karen O'Brien Cobb and the SOAS Centre of Yoga Studies. Um, thanks ever so much to you for joining us either as part of our live seminar or perhaps you might be watching this a little bit later online. I'm Ruth Westerby, a doctoral candidate at SOAS and a member of the Centre of Yoga Studies. And um, we had planned these sessions as live sessions before COVID struck um, and we're very happy to be able to offer some of these, some of our programme online at the moment and very grateful to uh, Karen for speaking with us alongside some other fantastic scholars. So you can find out about the work that we've put online through um, uh, on, on YouTube, uh, through our social media channels, through Instagram and through uh, Facebook. So I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Karen O'Brien Kopp here today. She is the lecturer in Asian religions and ethics at Roehampton University. She researches classical South Asian Sanskrit texts and culture on meditation and yoga, in particular, the interconnections of Hinduism and Buddhism and philosophy of mind. She's previously worked as senior teaching fellow at SOAS, University of London, where she also completed her doctoral research. So we are devastated that we have lost Karen from SOAS, but delighted that she's working on the manuscript of her PhD thesis, which will be published with Bloomsbury Academic, which is Rethinking Classical Yoga and Buddhism. Um, Karen has also published in the International Journal the Journal of Indian Philosophy and in Religions of South Asia, so you can find her previous articles there. She's also co-edited with Suzanne Newcomb, the forthcoming Routledge Handbook on Yoga and Meditation Studies. In fact, that will be coming out on the 29th of October, so you'll be able to hopefully access a copy of that very soon. And the SOAS Centre of Yoga Studies are very pleased to be able to launch that with um, Suzanne and Karen soon. So this session um, is discussing entangled ontologies in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, Sankhya, Sarvastivada and Sautrantika. So I'm sure you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Karen O'Brien Kopp to speak for us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth, for that very kind introduction. Uh, and as Ruth uh, mentioned, I will be um, sharing some material with you at the beginning of the seminar this evening. Um, around the theme of entangled ontologies in the Patanjala Yoga Shastra. Uh, and it is work in progress, so I do invite your comments and interaction afterwards in the discussion period. I'm just going to share my screen. And as the title um, indicates we're going to be talking about ontology, ontologies this evening. Um, to define ontology very basically at the outset, uh, ontology is generally uh, identified as a branch of metaphysics, um, metaphysics being the theory of reality and um, how reality comes into being, um, and ontology more specifically looking at theories of being um, and including notions of the self and nature and the relation of the self to reality. Uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at a couple of passages that discuss karma retribution mechanisms in relation to rebirth. Uh, but we'll also be thinking more widely about um, some of the technical debates and language around ontology and causality in relation to karma in uh, two texts in particular. My own background is that um, I'm interested in Buddhist ideas in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra um, and in particular in this session I'm going to be talking about um, the ideas that we can link to a text called the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya. Um, so to give you a little bit of an introduction to this text and its context, um, because at my starting point in a way is to assume, rightly or wrongly, that many of you are more familiar with the Patanjali Yoga Shastra than you would be with a text uh, such as the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya. Um, so it's uh, authored by Vasubandhu. It's um, located in time to approximately the same period for the compilation as the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. Um, it's, it consists of Karikas, which are the verses that lay out um, a set of orthodox doctrines uh, within uh, Sarvastivada Abhidharma. 
and it also contains a commentary, which is generally thought to be an auto-commentary by Vasubandhu. Uh, if we think about Abhidharma as a main uh, school of Buddhism within um, what's called mainstream uh, Buddhism, it's uh, a school that evolves from the late first millennium before the common era and flourishes into the beginning of the common era. And typically it's described as representing a quite scholastic and technical approach, although not only because of course meditation and practices of meditation are also very important within um, Abhidharma and particularly within Sarvastivada Abhidharma, um, which is one of the key schools of Abhidharma, um, one of the only schools for which we have an extant corpus and the school takes its name for the, from the doctrine, the Vada, um, that everything exists, um, Sarvam Asti, um, which really refers to um, the idea that dharmas, here indicating the ontological constituents of reality, um, they exist in three modes of time, so Sarvada Asti, um, which are past, present, and future. And of course, what, um, what the Buddhist thinkers are grappling with in a text like the Abhidharma Koshabhashya and other Savastivada texts is the, um, it's the Buddhist theory of uh, momentariness uh, in relation to time, the theory of transitoriness and transience, and how this is um, reconciled with theories of um, cause and effect um, with causality. And so we have this central problem that a school like Savastivada is grappling with, which is how do we explain causal continuity in the mental processes if there is only ever one momentary awareness or dharma at any one point in time. Um, so essentially grappling with this problem of um, how cause and effect in relation to the theory of karma intersects with the theory of um, what Dhamma Jyoti calls tri-temporality, the theory of past, present and future, all existing simultaneously. Um, and of course, a Patanjali doesn't have to deal with this ontological conundrum because he adheres to the Sankhya ontology in which there is a theory of a permanent substratum to reality. But nonetheless, we can see that Patanjali in the text, in the Bhashya, especially, is incorporating some of the technical terms and some of the arguments that we see in a Sarvastivada treatise like the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya. And um, just to wrap up this brief introduction, uh, the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya um, represents not just one main doctrinal position, but has two uh, doctrinal positions in conversation. So the Karikas quite often lay out what are known as the orthodox doc doctrinal positions, which are derived from the Vibhasha, the commentaries on Abhidharma. And the Bhashya, or the commentary itself, in the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya, often reflects um, what are sometimes called dissident positions by a different group who are the Sautrantikas. So the Vaibhashikas are the more orthodox adherents who take their name from the Vibhasha. The Sautrantikas take their name from the, the word Sutra, or in Pali, Sutta, indicating that in a way they want to perhaps reform um, Sarvastivada, um, or they certainly want to return to um, the earlier understandings of the suttas, of the sermons of the Buddha, and they're positing that they have a um, a handle on the on the true or original teachings of Buddhism. So, um, why introduce uh, these uh, Vaibhashika and Sautrantika ideas? Well, I want to argue that it is necessary to understand something about these Buddhist discourses in the late fourth, early fifth century on ontology, theories of being, and liberation or soteriology, um, in order to better understand some of the technical points and the technical vocabulary that we will encounter when we read the Patanjala Yoga Shastra. 
Uh, and of course, it is necessary, it's vital um, to read Patanjali's text within the Sankhya and Brahmanical tradition, which constitute its main religious and philosophical frame and its core soteriology. Um, but what I'll be arguing is that in the details of meditation techniques, of practices, um, how one achieves those soter soteriological goals, um, it's less rigidly tied, I think, to Sankhya ontology. And what we're presented with is sometimes more of a mixed bag of ideas, techniques and practices, not only from including those in Buddhism, but also within Jainism, which I won't be discussing this evening, but which is a whole other area for research and conversation. So to move on to um, think more formally about the context of interaction as debate. We cannot underestimate the significance of the role of debate in the transmission of ideas between schools of thought in the so-called classical period. As Gombrich reminds us, the Buddha's teachings began in an atmosphere of debate in which the Buddha was necessarily winning over converts from Brahmanism using the skillful means of argument. In this respect, debate is built in to Buddhism or early Buddhism. In the first centuries of the first millennium of the common era, there was also the broader formal context of philosophical debates at the royal courts. And various historical sources claim that Vasubandhu, for example, took part in such debates. From these historical accounts, Anaka draws a picture of the intellectuals with whom Vasubandhu may have interacted, citing as possible contemporaries the poet Kalidasa, the lexicographer Amara Sinha, and the Mimamsa philosopher Shabara. And we might perhaps include Patanjali in there very tentatively in some shape or form. Although debates were initially organized at court where participants from different schools were obliged by the ruler to engage with each other institutionally, this approach was then embedded in the intellectual milieu so that it became commonplace to critically refine one's own position by engaging with opponents. If oral debate was an inherent part of intellectual life in the first centuries of the common era, it also filtered into the literary apparatus of the written tradition. Uh, albeit less dynamically. The voluminous Savastivada Mahavibhasha, which forms one basis for Vasubandhu's Abhidharma Koshabhasya, is itself a systematic record of the debates that occurred in a conference called by the Emperor Kanishka in the first or second centuries of the Common Era. And those whose views are quoted include Dharmadrata, Goshika, Vasumitra, and Buddha Teva. Anaka notes, of this um, treatise, this tremendous work often reads like a committee report with widely varying opinions being offered." Unquote. The Mahavibhasha shows acquaintance with Vaisheshika and Sankhya, as do the works of Ashvagosha in the second century of the Common Era. Vasubandhu in his work refutes both the Sankhyas and the Nyaya Vaisheshikas at various points, uh, especially in the Abhidharma Koshabhasha, Bashya and works such as the Paramartha Saptati. And the Sankhya Karika closes by claiming that it is a distillation of the key points of a lost work called the Shashti Tantra, but it excludes the consideration of opponents' views, indicating that these views were explored in the Shashti Tantra. So in short, argumentative pluralism is built into the philosophical texts of the early first millennium. And as Pollock states, quote, the classicity of Indian philosophy lies precisely in the development of reasoned argument in the face of wholesale conceptual assaults, unquote. So if we think now more specifically about the Patanjala Yoga Shastra, which is the Sutra and its Bhashya. Larson and Bhattacharya um, identify three main strands of thought within the Yoga Sutra, which is what they um, focus on. Those three strands being one or more Sankhya traditions, one or more Buddhist traditions, um, and an emerging philosophical yoga tradition that is compiling various older ascetic and religious strands of speculation. 
So they are very clear in their work, um, as are other scholars, that the Yoga Sutra is heavily dependent upon Buddhism and in particular shows um, connections to Sarvastivada and Sautrantika formulations. So Larson and Bhattacharya identify as specifically uh, Buddhist um, a number of different strands, including the philosophy of Nirodha Samadhi, um, so the concentration that leads to cessation, uh, with a focus on meditation and altered states of awareness. Another strand being the principal means of knowing as pratyaksha, uh, a pluralist ontology, um, and they list many other different strands that they explore. Uh, Larson and Bhattacharya extrapolate that because the terms of the Shashti Tantra are largely absent from the Yoga Sutra, while many more terms from Abhidharma Buddhism appear, uh, that there were, quote, two streams of early systematic philosophizing in India, namely the Shashti Tantra of Sankhya and the Abhidharma of the Sarvastivada and Sautrantika Buddhists. So they sum up these two streams of soteriological thought. Uh, with two terms. One is Vijnana, so knowledge-based philosophy, which they're uh, aligning with Sankhya, and the other is Niroda Samadhi, sensitive concentration, which is being derived, um, according to Larsen Bhattacharya, from the philosophy of Abhidharma. And I think it is worth highlighting that um, the foundational work of Sankhya, which is the lost Shashti Tantra, dates to around the second century, and we know this to be a period of flourishing for Abhidharma commentarial output. Okay, so um, before we move on to look at um, the passage that I want to concentrate on this evening, uh, I wanted to, in a sense, draw your attention to a different set of passages that you can investigate in your own time. Um, but which really just lay the ground for the argument that I'm going to make. So these two passages um, are taken from an article that I published in 2017, sometimes cited as 2018, in Religions of South Asia, um, in which um, I look at uh, a number of different passages but focus on these two. Uh, what we're seeing here is a number of terms that are highlighted in bold, which just um, guides us through the similarities, not only in the tech technical vocabulary, but um, in the way that the argument and the statements are being laid out and the arguments are unfolding. Uh, so what we have here is a quite technical um, set of statements in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra about uh, the seed of Klesha, Klesha Bija, which I'm not going to go into great detail, but the point here is that in order to um, understand in its broadest and deepest and most technical context this passage from the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, um, I would argue that it's very helpful to read alongside it a text like the Abhidharma Koshavashya, which is here specifically um, laying out a Sautrantika position. And to just sum up the, the points um, that I made in that article, that we have a very um, closely resonant um, technical understanding of um, the seeds of klesha or affliction, um, whether they're latent or manifest, whether they're dormant or awake, whether they have this specific potency or capacity, which is called samarthya or shakti, um, the state of the seed as it appears in a particular sequence in time and the way to destroy the seed. So these are um, ontological statements that I would argue are technically formulated in the Sautrantika context in a very specific way and are being referenced um, in quite a constructive way in the Patanjala Yoga Shastra, not necessarily refuted. But what I actually want to look at this evening is a different set of passages, um, and this is work in progress. So I want to look at um, an ontological argument with metaphoric underpinnings. <clears throat> so here I'm going to um, just briefly uh, give you some analytical highlights from a mirrored argument form between the Patanjali Yoga Shastra and a different 
passage from the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya, so looking at 213 and 4.94, or sections pulled out from um, those <coughs> verses or sutras and commentary. Both passages that you see here examine a set of arguments that explain ethical causality or karmic retribution in relation to rebirth. The argument in both texts is similar in terms of the form and sequence, although not in terms of the doctrinal content or necessarily in the conclusion that is reached. <clears throat> um, both passages appear within a doctrinal discussion of karma within their respective texts. The Patanjala argument occurs in the second pada, in which the Patanjali Yoga Shastra's most dense discussions of karma theory occur and which opens with how Kriya Yoga is used to eliminate klesha or affliction in relation to karma and vipaka, the maturation of karma. The argument form is part of a longer discussion on karma and how the roots and the substratum of klesha sustain patterns of karmic retribution across life and beyond death. In the Abhidharma Koshabhashya, the relevant passage occurs in chapter 4, which is dedicated to the topic of karma, and Vasubandhu's argument is part of a discussion on how the doctrine of action works according to various scriptural sources. So although the conclusions of each argument form differ, the structure of e each argument, as you can see, is similar. So if we um, distill some of the assertions, um, and you can ignore the highlighting <coughs> on this slide, um, so we have four assertions that are contained in the argument form, in the propositions and their sequence. As you can see here in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, we have um, A, B, C and D. I've, I've um, given them letter codes. So we have the assertion one karma produces one birth, one karma produces or leads to multiple births, multiple karma produce multiple births, and finally, multiple karma lead to one birth. And then in the Abhidharma Koshabhashya, we have um, a slightly reduced number of statements. So although the four, the four assertions are very similar, they are grouped and sequenced differently. As we can see, Patanjali's argument contains four discrete propositions that are presented as alternatives. So in a sense, the argument um, is exploring which of these is true. Is it A, is it B, is it C, or is it D? But Vasubandhu's argument, um, in a sense, is more complex. It expresses two main propositions, each of which contains a combined assertion. Um, so uh, Vasubandhu's uh, argument is trying to determine relationships between statement A and D and relationships between uh, statement A and statement B. So Patanjali's text, as we can see, offers a straightforward choice between the four propositions, A or B or C or D, and we find out that D is the valid statement, but Vasubandhu's argument presents a more complex choice between the propositions A, D or A, B in two different combinations, and it completely omits assertion C, which to remind us is multiple karmas project multiple births. So if we now briefly sum up the conclusion of the two argument forms, Patanjali's argument is structured to lead to the conclusion multiple karmas produce one birth. Uh, but this simplicity belies uh, complexity. Those multiple karmas are congealed into a single karmic entity, which is karmashaya or karmic store, to produce a single birth. So Patanjali's concluding statement includes, in fact, two assertions. One karma leads to one birth and multiple karmas congealed lead to one birth. Um, this may seem to be similar to the conclusion of Vasubandhu's argument, which uh, concludes that one karma leads to one birth and multiple karmas lead to one birth. So this is a complex position or conclusion and both Patanjali and Vasubandhu use metaphors to formulate it conceptually. 
In another part of the same commentarial passage, uh, Patanjali Yoga Shastra 2.13, Patanjali uses the metaphor of a fisherman's net to illustrate how diverse accumulated vasanas might be knotted together into a single mind entity that can capture information for the next life. In contrast, Vasubandhu's metaphor is that of a painting. A painter might sketch out a form, but she then, or he then, fills it or fleshes it out with detail. <clears throat> Similarly, as a result of karma, a person receives a sketched outline form of rebirth, broadly concurrent with one's previous life form. So this is in um, the Abhidharma Koshabhasya. But the conglomerated karmic store determines the details and qualities of that new rebirthed form. So this analysis of the two passages suggests that Patanjali and Vasubandhu were referring to a common argument. And this probability is further increased by the way in which Patanjali prefaces the opening of his argument with uh, tatredam vicharyate, or in this respect, it is deliberated, which could suggest an argument that was already in the public sphere. Um, and it, it could perhaps strengthen the argument that the Patanjala Yoga Shastra postdates the Abhidharma Koshabhashya. Why might we make such a statement? Well, this particular argument form also appears in the first or second century of the Common Era in the Abhidharma Vibhasha. And just to remind us, this is the text on which the Abhidharma Koshabhashya draws and from which the Vibhashikas take their name. And so Patanjali may have been responding to the earlier Vibhasha passage, or indeed to this form that we see in the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya. Um, so just to wrap up, I want to now um, explore in a little further detail um, how Patanjali's uh, passage and the, and the broader um, commentarial passage in which this uh, sits is in a sense, peppered with the technical terminology of Savastivada karma theory, and indeed appears to be directly refuting positions in the Abhidharma Koshabhasya. So on closer inspection, the frame of the argument form is somewhat deceiving on the whole, um, because it is less about singular or plural karmic effects and more about how particulars and universals are generated in karmic action. So if we go back to um, the quotation itself, we have uh, the terms eka and aneka, which are generally translated, of course, as singular and non-singular or plural. Uh, but what I want to show here is that within the Buddhist discourse, they also have more technical um, meanings. <clears throat> so in the Abhidharma Koshabhasya, the precise context of the passage um, that we've looked at, if we read around it, um, is that of the two types of karma, Akshepaka karma and Paripuraka karma. So Dhammajati translates these two terms as projecting and completing karmas, while Cox translates them as skeletal and fleshing out karmas. And this refers to the relationship of uh, genus and the specific in the qualities that determine rebirth. So while uh, projecting karma or akshipaka karma projects a single birth, other karmas of the paripuraka type, the completing type, are responsible for determining the specific qualities of that rebirth such as lifespan, identity, wealth, etc. And in particular, Akshepa is a term that is specifically associated with the Vaibhashikas. As part of their theory of action, as existing across the three time periods, they assert that in the moment in which action is completed, it uh, projects uh, Akshepati or grasps its result. So these two terms, Akshepaka and Paripuraka, are in fact synonymous with the terms eka karma, single act, and aneka karma, um, non-single or various acts. And so Patanjali's argument also, if we look at his use of uh, eka and aneka, um, 
Patanjali's uh, argument is not only referring to single and plural, eka and aneka acts and rebirths, but also to the theory behind these terms. Single acts determine a rebirth, but multiple acts determine the specific qualities of a rebirth together in combination. So the specific technical use of the term Arkshipaka in Savastivada karma theory suggests that Patanjali's use of the term Arkshipati in his argument is not incidental. And just to add um, a, a few more details about the technical language, in the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya, a karma or an action may have a determinate maturation, which is a niyata vipaka, or an indeterminate maturation, uh, aniyata. In the case of determinate maturation, which is certain, there are three possibilities. Um, so if we commit an action, either it's experienced, it's karmic retribution is experienced as a phenomenon in this life, or it's experienced in the next life, or it may be experienced further down the line after a number of rebirths. And we find uh, a very similar discussion in the broader commentarial passage at 2.13 of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, which I'm not going to go into now. Furthermore, um, if, we, if we read more widely around these, these two arguments that are on the slide, um, both the Abhidharma Kosha Bhajya and um, the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, so just staying in chapter four of the Abhidharma Kosha Bhajya and chapter two of Patanjali's text, they discuss the immediate and the determinate maturation of uh, intense kleshas, uh, tivra klesha, and they also both discuss in quite um, connected ways um, karma as either black or white in various combinations. Um, of course, these are uh, uh, argument forms that circulate beyond these texts and also beyond these uh, religio-philosophical communities. So the discourse of these two passages um, that I have compared, I would argue, are overlapping to the extent that they appear to be in dialogue. Topic by topic, both passages draw on the same philosophical discourse of ontology, karma theory and ethics, using a shared pool of technical terms for karma. Most notably, as um, I drew your attention to, Eka and Aneka, standing in for Akshipaka and Paripuraka, but also these other technical terms, if we read more widely, of the determinate, the indeterminate, and the black and white karmic effects. The Patanjali Yoga Shastra makes the argument on the basis of the karmic repercussions of single and multiple actions on rebirth. The Abhidharma Koshabhashya makes the argument on the basis of how rebirth is produced by a universal and particular characteristics that lead to homogeneous and heterogeneous aspects of transmigra transmigration. So these discursive correspondences suggest one of two things, either that both texts are crystallizations of the same milieu of live debate and interaction, or that one author is consciously making into textual revisions to the other's text as a form of refutation. And I will leave it there. <laughs>